Hey, this is Kenneth, and today I'm going to show you kind of a basic introduction to the phase lock loop. Uh, this is kind of a, one of the basic circuits that you uh, use in advanced digital and analog design, and I'm going to be using for a specific example the CD4046, which is part of the original 4000 CMOS series, which is a real standard jelly bean set of logic, much like the 7400 series, which most people will often see in many projects. The phase lock loop consists of three parts. You have the phase detector, the low pass filter, and the voltage controlled oscillator. The voltage controlled oscillator is probably the easiest to understand. You put in a DC voltage and it puts out some frequency. You raise the voltage, the frequency goes up. You lower the voltage, the frequency goes down. I'll, I'll demonstrate that live for you in a moment. What the voltage controlled oscillator does is it you feed that back into the phase detector. What the phase detector does is it compares the voltage controlled oscillator to a different input frequency. Um, so the input frequency would be some sort of analog signal or something that you need to recover or some sort of RF transmission and it would compare these two. It would look at the frequency coming in and it would look at the frequency from the VCO and it would make some sort of judgment as to whether these two signals were in phase or if one was a higher frequency than another and it would produce a, an error error signal so like if they were if the this if the VCO frequency was too low or it was behind in phase the phase detector would produce a positive error voltage if the VCO was too high or uh, ahead it would produce a low error voltage this would be fed into a low pass filter a low pass filter is a filter that only passes low frequencies. So it's it, like in music, um, if you were to put standard music through a low pass filter, you would only hear the bass and the low, you know, deep stuff. We're using this as kind of a long as a kind of a long term average. Is we're going to look at the error signals coming out over the last few cycles, and then use that to make a judgment on whether the control voltage that we're sending to the VCO is high, too high or too low. Because if we get a lot of positive error signals coming from the phase detector, then the, our control voltage is probably too low. And so the average will eventually slowly trend up and the VCO will lock on frequency. When we say lock, that means that at, when you first start it, this is going to be some random value. You're going to start re re feeding in some random frequency and the loop is going to have all sorts of errors because it's like, whoa, like these are completely different frequencies. All right. And eventually the VCO is going to be like wandering all over the place. And eventually once this frequency, the frequency in and the frequency out, or I guess the frequency out going back into the phase detector, once those are the same, the, lo the loop will be locked. And um, once it becomes locked, it'll be much more stable and it'll be able to track the input frequency if it drifts or anything very closely. All right, now, you kind of have to ask, what is this useful for? Um, the really simple example is you could use it as a frequency multiplier. So if you were in this feedback part of the loop to put in some sort of divide by n counter, so like the simplest would be a divide by two, what you would do is this frequency would be divided by two and then compared to the input frequency. So if we feed it, feed it in like one kilohertz here, um, we would get some sort of error signal. It would be filtered and then the voltage controlled oscillator would start making some frequency. But that frequency would be divided by two. And so if the voltage controlled oscillator was also running at one kilohertz, it would be divided by two and you end up with 500 hertz here, which would be too low. And so the phase detector would create a positive error voltage, it would get filtered, the VCO would slowly drift up to 2 kilohertz. 2 kilohertz out, but it's divided by 2, so it would go back and it would be 1 kilohertz here. And so we'd be comparing 1 kilohertz with 1 kilohertz. This would say, hey, these are in, you know, these are in phase and locked. We would, it would be slowly filtered and the VCO would be very stably running at 2 kilohertz. This obviously has other applications. Um, I mean, multiplying 1 kilohertz by 2 is you know, kind of a silly example, but this has all sorts of other useful examples 
where if you were to take something like an atomic clock, is this is a rubidium frequency standard that puts out 10 kilohertz, uh, 10 megahertz, sorry, 10 megahertz. So if you were to feed 10 megahertz in here, and then have some arbitrary divide by n here and another divide by m here, you could then divide these both down to some equal frequency and then multiply it out again to any frequency you wanted. And the stability of the output frequency is just as good as the input frequency. And so since this rubidium standard is crazy accurate, whatever frequency that you manage to synthesize from it would also be very, very good. So that's one example. Um, there's tons and tons of other examples. Um, and of course, if anything in this video doesn't make sense, I highly recommend the Horowitz, The Art of Electronics. I'll link, I'll link to this below. Um, this is where most of my information has come from, and it is an incredibly good book in this and many, 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 many other subjects. Um, but yeah, so let's try and show, show this to you live. So let's fire up my 1970s <coughs> classic era oscilloscope. And you see here, we have one square wave. So what I've done is I've taken one CD4046 and I've wired up just the voltage controlled oscillator on it with a potentiometer. So if I take a screwdriver, I can sit here and I can change the control, oh, it said if I could ch change the control voltage and it changes the frequency. I turn up the control voltage, the frequency goes up. I turn down the control voltage, the frequency goes down. So that is the voltage controlled oscillator. This of course has other useful uh, applications um, other than in the phase lock loop. So you'll see the 4046 kind of pop up in kind of random little projects. To kind of give you a, a more guttural understanding of this, I'm gonna take a little half watt speaker and I'm gonna plug it in. So you, hopefully now you can hear this kind of obnoxious square wave, which as I shift this will raise and lower in frequency. So that's the VCO. Now, what I'm doing is I'm feeding that VCO in as the frequency in to another, to a, the second CD4046, which I have actually built as this control loop. So we have a phase detector, a low pass filter, a voltage controlled oscillator, and then if the, uh, this voltage controlled oscillator feeds back and is compared to our first voltage control oscillator, which you see here. So that second one, you will see as channel two. Oh. So here's channel one, here's channel two, and you can see they are in frequency. And for your listening pleasure, I will give you both of them. So as you can see, they are at the same frequency and they are a locked phase apart. This is because we're using a type 1 phase detector. So now let's explain what these, what the two different types of phase detectors are and the advantages and disadvantages to each one. So let's now talk about how the operation of this phase detector. Um, the CD4046 happens to have both a phase detector and a voltage control oscillator. But the phase detector is generally the, heart, the more difficult part to build of this control loop. And so many phase locked loop chips will actually only have the phase detector and they'll expect you to build your own low pass filter and voltage controlled oscillator, which really isn't that hard. Um, so first, the type one phase detector. Um, Thinking about it digitally, the, phase, the type one phase detector is very analogous to the exclusive OR, or XOR, gate. What the exclusive OR gate does is it compares two, two signals and it outputs a positive signal when they're different and a zero signal when they are the same. So given uh, an input signal up here on the top and uh, the VCO signal down here in the middle, you can see when the VCO frequency uh, signal goes high early, this is low, this is high, output signal goes high. And so at this point it would start raising the frequency 
of the VCO until the input frequency, uh, in input signal goes high. Then they're both high and the error signal goes low. One goes low, this, uh, so the VCO is now low and the input is high, error signal is high, then the input signal finally goes low and they're both low and the error signal is low. Now eventually, if these two frequencies were different, um, the width of these error signals being high and low would be different. Um, and eventually it would change the VCO frequency until it matched this frequency. Unfortunately, the average of these error signals when they're locked has to be the correct control voltage. So once you feed the red signal through the low-pass filter, it has to be the right signal to run the VCO at the same frequency as FN. But that's not necessarily going to be halfway up our control voltage. So we're running the, I'm running this on 5 volts right now, and so it's not necessarily 2.5 volts. So the width of the air positive and negative error signals won't necessarily be 50%. If we need to run the VCO at 4 volts of the 5 volts, the high part's going to be 80% wide, and the low part's going to be 20%. Um, because we need to take the average of this and have it end up being the right VCO control voltage. This, the width of these signals are a function of how out of phase these are. Because as you can see there, it's about 90 degrees out of phase right now is because this positive edge is one quarter of a wavelength earlier than this positive edge. And so right now it's 90 degrees out of phase. And so the average of this would be 50%. But if we need to run the VCO at like 80% or 90% of the, of the uh, power supply voltage, we need this even farther out of phase. So we're going to need this closer to 180 degrees out of phase. Where if we need to run the VCO at a lower voltage, almost down to zero, these need to be much more closer in phase. And so depending on where you are in your VCO range, the, f the frequencies will always be the same when the loop is locked. But when the loop is locked, the phase will vary from zero degrees out to 180 degrees. All right. So let's show you that now, hopefully, uh, we'll show that to you now on my oscilloscope. So here's the input signal, here's the output signal, as you can see, I saw it kind of ramped up until it locked onto it. And now, if I could find my screwdriver, here we go. So now taking my screwdriver, I'm going to adjust the input frequency. So you can see, just as we predicted, the output is leading by 90 degrees, right? Because we're kind of, we're right in the middle of our control voltage. We're running about two and a half volts. So now if I were to raise the frequency, oh, come on. Of course it isn't gonna lock on me now. All right, so there's, it's locked. Now if I, slowly move it upwards boy it really doesn't want to anyways um, as, as I turn it up you can kind of see that this positive part is getting closer to this negative part I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it all the way to 5 volts without this loop unlocking on me um, but you can kind of see the see, see the point is as we get higher in control voltage, this phase gets farther and farther uh, until the point where we're almost completely out of phase between these two square waves. Now something you, you'll notice is as I'm running this, our low pass filter isn't very good. Is I'll talk about that, you know, once we talk about the phase comparators, I'll talk about that later. Um, but you can see, you know, every time we kick it. The output phase oscillates quite a bit before it finally settles down. Um, but we'll talk about that you know, later, because we want to talk about uh, phase detectors first. So that was the type 1 phase detector. Luckily, that someone at some point, uh, back in the banal history of electrical engineering, came up with a very creatively named type 2 phase detector. The type 2 phase detector differs from the type 1 
in that it doesn't look at the levels of the signals, but it simply looks at the edges of the signals. Um, in the CD4046, it happens to look at the positive edges. There's no reason why you couldn't look at the negative edges instead, um, but they just chose the positive ones. So what the type 2 phase detector does is it watches for these positive edges and it outputs an error signal based on whether the VCO positive edge is early or late compared to the input one. This has all sorts of advantages because now our duty cycles don't have to be exactly 50%. If we're looking at very, very short pulses, the type 1 phase detector would give almost continual error voltages where now we're only looking for the edge. And so it doesn't matter how wide this positive and this negative part are, because we're only watching for the edge, in case you haven't picked up on that yet. Um, and so what the VCO, what the phase detector does is it says, ah, here's the input positive edge, and it watches for the VCO positive edge. And while it's waiting here in the middle, it outputs a positive error signal to try and speed the VCO up and bring its edge closer to now. The trick is, though, once it sees this second positive edge and says, ah, all right, we're good, it doesn't go low, like in the type 1, but it goes into this high impedance state where it won't change the uh, control voltage at all. And so now at this, in this region, the VCO is going to be running at a fixed frequency until the phase detector sees another positive edge. In this case, it happens to see a positive edge from the input again, and it says, up. Oh, the VCO is late, and it starts outputting a positive until it sees the positive edge. Um, I guess I kind of screwed up my diagram. Um, then, almost right away, since it's at a... <coughs> we're doing this live. Um, and then, almost right away, it's going to see another positive edge from the uh, input frequency, and so it's going to start outputting a 1 again. Now, obviously, if the VCO was running at a higher frequency, you would start seeing these positive edges before the input positive edges and the phase detector would start pulling it low which you know would then lower the frequency of the VCO and start putting these edges farther in the future and hopefully in phase with these positive edges. Now the big advantage here is when the loop is finally locked and it isn't changing the VCO control voltage these two edges are always going to be lined up. And these edges are going to be lined up. And there's going to be, not only are they going to be at the same frequency, there's going to be no phase difference between the two signals, the frequency in and the frequency of the VCO. This lack of phase difference is advantageous in the control loop because the low pass filter is going to have some sort of phase difference to it. And if we can remove this phase difference, um, it's much easier to make a stable loop. As, as you just saw with the type 1 phase detector, it was kind of hard for me to get it to lock outside of the middle frequency range. The farther you went out of the center, um, the low pass filter and the phase detector couldn't generate the correct control voltage to lock onto it. With the Type 2, um, it's going to be much more forgiving as far as the lock range, is the kind of the range of frequencies that this loop can lock onto. All right, so let's switch from pin 2, which is the Type 1 phase detector, to pin 13, which is the Type 2 phase detector. Conveniently, this 4046 provides us with both. So again, we let my fantastically antique oscilloscope warm up. If anyone from, like, Rigel would like to sponsor my blog, I will gladly take any digital four-channel oscilloscope. And I will put your, you know, every post will be sponsored by Rigel pretty much ever. So, uh, give me a call. It'd be nice. Turning on our control voltage, though. Here's the input. Here's the output. You can see it's still oscillating quite a bit. That's because of our low-pass filter. But eventually, when it locks, you can see these positive edges, this positive edge and this positive edge, are perfectly lined up. All right? If we change the frequency, 
again, it oscillates because they have a bad low pass filter, but eventually they lock. If we go down in frequency, they lock. And positive edge, positive edge, all perfectly lined up. So the type 2 phase detector is in many ways superior to type 1 when you're dealing with square waves like this. The type 1 is much easier to implement in analog signals and sine waves and stuff. Um, so they both certainly have applications. But as you can see, the type 2 phase detector is um, in many ways very um, gives you much more flexibility than the type 1 does. Just to show you again, I'm going to zero out the uh, loop. So we're going to short out the VCO control voltage. So now it's running at zero, and we're going to let it come up and relock again. And as you see, almost very, very quickly, it comes up and locks onto it. So that's the difference between a type 1 and a type 2 phase detector. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like, um, instead of looking at the output, we're going to look at the actual phase detector. So this is the output of the type 2 phase detector. So ideally when the loop is locked, it's going to be completely in this middle high impedance range. Um, unfortunately, due to such reality inconveniences as input impedances of the VCO and leakages through the capacitor, um, it inevitably is going to have to um, refill the capacitor just a little bit so there is going to be a little bit of positive voltage. But so now if we were to turn down the VCO, you can see that it starts putting out low voltages as well until eventually it locks onto it again and we end up again with just this small positive pulse, which ideally isn't there, but we need because of such inconveniences as leakage. Um, and then this line right here is while the type 2 phase detector is high impedance, and so that's actually the voltage on the capacitor. And so you can see that as I turn the potentiometer down, this high impedance line, or the voltage on the capacitor, actually matches the voltage coming out of our potentiometer, which is only connected to the system by the frequency. Fun fact, this is actually a way to decode FM radio stations, because if you had the FM radio station coming into this, and you had your phase lock loop locked onto it, the control voltage of the phase lock loop would actually be the original audio frequencies used to modulate your, you know, 95.7 megahertz FM radio station. Fun fact. Um, so that is the, what the output of the phase, type 2 phase detector looks like. Where if we look at, again, at the type 1 phase detector, which isn't going to lock on this strange of a frequency, and I said if we actually looked at the type 1 phase detector. So now it's locked, and you can see it's positive half the time and negative half the time. This is why having the low-pass filter is important, because if we didn't have the low-pass filter, during this time the VCO would try and run at its highest frequency, and during this time it would try and run at, run at its lowest frequency, which isn't what we want. We want it to be running at the average of these two signals. Um, this is with the potentiometer right in the middle. If we try and bend it downwards, so at a lower frequency, you can now see that the top portion of the phase detector is narrower than the bottom portion. Not not significantly in this case because I can't bend it very far out of lock. Yeah, so you, you, you can kind of see that this is about 
one, two, three, four, four and a half divisions there, and that's about two and a half divisions there. So we're running at about one third of the VCO control voltage, which matches the potentiometer. So that's what the output of the phase detectors look like, which then goes through the low pass filter into the VCO. Now we're going to talk about this low pass filter, which as you can kind of see, since um, is giving us some problems. Since if I sit here and kick it, even when they're on the right frequency, and even if I just do a real mild yoink or a yoink, you can see that the output jitters quite a bit. Um, even with the far superior, in this case, type 2 phase detector, it still oscillates. And at many frequencies, it'll keep oscillating, or it'll actually go completely unstable. As you can see, if we raise this, eventually this starts oscillating so much Oh, it's not going to do it for me now. I said if we go far enough, it'll start oscillating. <laughs> I said if we start do this and go far enough, it'll start oscillating so much that it'll actually go un completely unstable, as you saw there. So that is a problem. That is when the phase delay between the type 1 phase comparator, which I switched back to, and the low pass filter goes beyond 180 degrees and the loop just can't lock. We can sit here all day and it, it won't lock at all. We'll be very sad, um, but it just won't do it. Um, and that's kind of a problem. So I'll, I'll sketch out the schematic for your basic low pass filter and show you how we can fix it and then I'll show you vastly improved performance. So lastly, let's talk about the low pass filter. So what you see here is this is about the most basic low pass filter you can have. This is a first order RC low pass filter. So what it has is it has a resistor here and a capacitor to ground. And so any high frequency signals would be bypassed by the capacitor and any DC or low signal or low frequency signals would be stored on the capacitor and then output it to the VCO. So this is what we've been using so far. Um, you'll notice that with a 100 kilo ohm resistor and a 10 microfarad capacitor, this is a incredibly slow filter, um, which I deliberately did so that you could s that you would be able to see it actually like you know ramping up and seeing how it oscillates and kind of putting this all onto a kind of a temporal scale that would be easy to demonstrate, but obviously you would design a better filter that would better meet your needs as far as um, being able to lock on um, and you'd have a much wider lock range and everything with a faster filter that, you know, this has a time constant of like one second. Um, but as you saw with this, it oscillated. Um, there was quite a bit of jitter um, in the phase as it tried to get closer to lock. Um, and kind of the easiest way to resolve that is you add what's called lag compensation. Um, there's lead compensation and lag lead compensation, and then there's all of the proportional and proportional integral and proportional integral differential. Um, all these, there's a you know, tremendous number of uh, co uh, different compensators, and like I've taken whole classes on this, and unfortunately my class is very good, but the key to lag compensation is you add a second resistor in series with capacitor. Um, I put in a 10k ohm and so the initial speed of the filter is essentially about the same because you have 100k ohm plus 10k ohm so that's 110k ohm and a, the 10 microfarad capacitor. So we've only slowed um, the first order filter down by 10%. Um, if you had slowed it down by like an order of magnitude, if you had just tried to add more resistance here to be as effective as this one, um, you would have to significantly slow it down and it would take even longer for a phase lock loop to lock. But by putting this 10k ohm resistor here, we've kind of put a second low pass filter from the capacitor out, you know, um, out to the output. Or um, I got that about wrong. I'm, 
inevitably I'm going to get this get the, it's subtly along, but essentially lag compensation um, gives us a better gives us this about the same DC performance as the low pass filter, but as you get in higher frequencies, um, it gets a kind of a better knee to it than just the 20 decibels that you get with the low pass. Um, and so I'll show this to you uh, right now on the oscilloscope. I'll kind of show you the difference between the first order low pass filter and the lag compensator. So we let my oscilloscope warm up. Alright, so again, input signal up here, output signal down here. You can see that we're using a type 1 phase comparator and if I just kind of tweak it, you can see that it oscillates. Tweak it again, it oscillates. Alright, so now what we're going to do is add the 10k ohm resistor in series with it, kick it, and you can see it shifts, but boy it is stable. It's quite a bit more stable. Zero out the VCO and let it catch up again. You, um, fun fact, the type 1 phase comparator can actually lock on to harmonics of it. Um, which is a little unfortunate. So as you see here, it locked onto the um, kind of the one and a half. Um, the the input frequency is one and a half times the output frequency. Um, so we'll just have to break that lock for a moment. As you can see, um, it's much stabler. Although again, with the type 1 phase comparator, we don't have quite the lock range that we do with the type 2 phase comparator. Um, though you can see with this one, it's very stable. Right? If we switch back to just the low pass filter, so that's it oscillating, but since we can filter out that high frequency noise better without losing our DC response by putting in the lag compensator, you can see now it's much, much more stable. Alright, so that was <clears throat> so that was the low pass filter part here. Um, I just implemented it with some passive resistors and capacitors but obviously you could use op amps and gyrators and you could over design the most sophisticated low pass filter um, that you could ever want um, to be as part of this control loop. Um, I've taken several mechanical engineering classes in control loop theory um, but they weren't so practical or applied um, so I fully Diswarrant any um, claims I made here as far as actually getting any of the technical app applied details of that correct because I inevitably probably did not. Um, and so it's kind of one final last thing. Um, we're going to slow this filter down way slow. So where this is a 10 microfarad, we're going to take this, I believe it's a thousand. That'd be kind of, yeah, I believe this is a, yeah, so this is a thousand microfarad. So we're going to slow this filter down a um, hundred times and we're going to start it grounded and so the VCO is essentially stopped because of um, because the output is you know the the capacitor is completely discharged and so as it slowly ever so slowly is going to pick up here hopefully yeah so you can see it, it got its first transition and so as you can see, the output is slowly, ever so slowly, increasing. And obviously this is obscenely slow. I mean, this is like a 100 second time constant filter. So you would never actually design a phase lock loop with a 100 second filter on it. Um, but this will very de well demonstrate um, this kind of semi-harmonic, semi-lock, the, the harmonic semi-locks that it gets. Is even with the type 2 phase comparator, you'll see that every time that it reaches some round multiple of the input frequency, 
it's going to go into this kind of semi-lock state and it's going to sit there for a long time before it breaks uh, lock on it. And as it gets closer, these semi-locks will actually last longer. With the Type 1 phase comparator, you can actually solidly lock onto harmonics. Um, but you want to be careful that when you design it, that you design your filter fast enough so that it doesn't lock on one of these and be kind of obnoxious. Um, but yeah, I thought this would kind of be just an entertaining way to end the video. So please enjoy. As you can, you can see, when these two positive edges line up, it'll break the semi-lock because the Type 2 Faith Comparator watches for these edges. And so the, negative, the positive feedback, which will increase this frequency, doesn't occur until the positive edges line up. And so as it reaches each harmonic, um, the, the music majors in the audience, of which I know there are actually several, um, will actually be able to tell you which chords each of these semi-locks are, um, because these semi-locks are actually very much based on it being an octave apart, or a fifth apart, or a third apart, and then some of the faster ones will be minor chords. Um, and this actually goes to show that you can quite possibly find a lot of useful applications for the CD4046 or other simpler, uh, other simple phase lock loops in any sort of music synthesizer. Um, because this will kind of grab onto some frequency and kind of hold to it, and then you can have it kind of drift away from it in one direction or another based on some other control frequency. So this would be a real easy square square wave generator and, and kind of the next progression um, beyond your standard um, 556 uh, Atari Punk synth. As you can see that these lo locks now are lasting really long. Um, and I think is that pot that might I think that isn't quite a lock because I think we're on like a diminished second or something. Um, so it'll very, very slowly phase shift. Um, I don't know, that might, that might be the right frequency. So the main problem now is it's out of phase. Uh, and so again, between these two positive edges, it's sending a little bit of positive blip, which will pull it over. Well, that might just be because of the leakage of the capacitor. But anyways, um, so that was kind of a demonstration of it starting from a complete stop and kind of what the phase lock loop kind of likes about the two signals being locked onto each other. So this is the 4046. Obviously in modern eras, anal uh, people like Texas Instruments and Analog have put out significantly more powerful and faster and fancier phase lock loops with programmable like 14-bit dividers built into them and everything. Um, I will likely eventually build some sort of RF frequency th synthesizer based on my rubidium standard um, for amateur radio, but this has a multitude of applications. Um, so this was Kenneth showing you phase lock loops with a little bit of hopefully mostly correct control loop theory built in. Um, enjoy!